get started. Yes. Are we recording? You can go ahead and gavel in. Okay, great. Uh, I'd like to call to order the February 8th, 2022 meeting of the Environment Committee. And we will begin with a roll call to ensure that we have a quorum. Okay, thank you. Council Member Fredson. Council Member Fredson, I see that you're on the call. You may need to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear yes. you. Thank you so much. Yep. Sterner? Here. Vento? Here. Wolf? Here. Zarin? Present. And for the record, Council Member Lindstrom will not be joining us today. Thank you. Next up is the reading of the chair statement, which says the Metropolitan Council chair has determined it is not practical or prudent to conduct in-person meetings in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Accordingly, committee members will participate in this meeting via telephone or interactive technology, and the meeting will be conducted under Minnesota statute section 13D.021. We encourage you to monitor the meeting remotely. If you have comments, we encourage members of the public to email us at public.info at metc.state.mn.us and we will respond to your comments in a timely manner. Next up is approval of the agenda. We will consider the agenda approved unless somebody has a objection or wants to make some sort of change to the agenda. Does anybody have any changes? Seeing none, we will consider the agenda approved and we will go to the approval of the minutes for the January 11th, 2022 regular meeting of the Environment Committee. Do we have a motion and a second? Sterner motions to approve the minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any discussion? With no discussion, Susan, you can call the roll. Thank you. And just for clarification, uh, was that Council Member Vento that seconded? Yes. yes. Thank you. Fredson? Fredson? Aye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Sterner? Aye. Vento? Aye. Wolf? Aye. And Zarin? Aye. Thank you. The minutes are approved as written. Our first business item is 2022-41 Adopt Facility Plan for the Hastings Wastewater Treatment Plant MCES Project number 809800. Heidi Hutter, are you presenting? Yes, I am. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. This afternoon, Chad Davison and I would like to share with you a summary of the public review process for relocation of the Hastings Wastewater Treatment Plant. And we'd like to do that before we request adoption of the facility plan. Next slide, please. On November 10th, the council approved a request to hold a public hearing for this facility plan. And this slide just kind of summarizes that public review process that followed that approval. On December 3rd, a public hearing invitation was mailed to almost 300 residents and property owners that were located anywhere near the proposed project area, um, as well as to about 35 government and community stakeholders. Then the public comment period was opened on December 5th with a legal notice of the public hearing posted in the Pioneer Press. We then held a virtual open house on December 15th, and the purpose of that was to introduce the project to the community. The virtual public hearing was then held on January 5th. Uh, we did have about 20 attendees and we had a, it was a higher than anticipated engagement for this event. We ended up with 11 questions asked uh, before the event occurred and then about three during that public hearing. We didn't receive any additional comments after the public hearing and the closing of that public comment period happened on January 18th. The public comment period was open then for a total of 44 days, and that does exceed the minimum 30 day requirement. From December 22nd through January 18th, there were hard copies of the facility plan available at both the Hastings City Hall and also at the Pleasant Hill Library. 
The facility plan was also available on the project website at hastingswwtp.com. Today, we are here to request adoption of the facility plan by council, and that will be prior to submitting that facility plan to the PCA next month in order to qualify for funding through the Minnesota Public Facilities Authority. Next slide, please. Before we review uh, information specific to the public comment period, I would like to take a moment to review the major scope items and the need for this work. The Hastings plant is located on just over three acres in downtown Hastings, and it's bordered by a railroad, the Mississippi River, and a well-developed residential area. The existing site has limited room for expansion, and that would be expansion that would be required in order for us to respond to growth within the service area or to respond to potential future regulatory requirements. So relocation of the Hastings plant at this time avoids major investment at a site that really can no longer meet the long-term needs of our service area. The plant would be relocated about two miles southeast of the existing plant site onto council-owned property. The construction cost estimate for this work is $145 million, and that includes a standard 30% contingency for undefined design details and also a 3% annual escalation cost to account for inflation and labor and materials that would be anticipated, anticipated between now and the time of construction. So that puts the total program cost at about 165 million and that includes the 20% um, for engineering and administration, which would be needed to complete design and to support construction of the program. The new plant, and the outfall to the Mississippi River kind of account for the bulk of that cost at about 139 million. That work would be delivered via the design build process and it would be anticipated to occur between 2024 and 2026. Following that, there would be at least one year of commissioning um, and process proving in 2027. A new lift station, force main, and a gravity sewer would also be needed in order to transport the wastewater to the new plant site. The lift station and conveyance system are estimated at a combined cost of about 23 million. And that work we would expect to deliver via our traditional design big build process from 24 to 26. We would have commissioning complete just prior to startup of our new plant. Following successful commissioning of the plant, then the existing plant would be decommissioned and the land would be returned to the city of Hastings for redevelopment. That cost is estimated at about $3 million. Next slide, please. We received several comments that were related to site selection and facility siting from Craig Christensen, who is an area resident. The responses really highlighted the suitability of the site for a wastewater treatment plant and how we plan to leverage the site's topography to minimize disruption to the natural landscape. All of the questions were answered in a satisfactory manner with no additional follow-up required at this time. Next slide, please. We also received several questions related to the site purchase from Tyler Shizuski, also an area resident. The responses regarding previous ownership and use of the site, along with the site purchase price, were provided um, in an email, and they'll also be included in a facility plan. All questions were answered in a satisfactory manner, and there were no additional, uh, no additional follow-up is required at this time. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, these three questions were received during the public hearing. Uh, they're from a consulting firm that is interested in the project. Uh, all three questions were answered during the public hearing. And there be, the response will be included in the final facility plan. Next slide, please. Uh, these two comments were received during the public hearing. They're both from a City of Hastings Council member, Dana Fulch. First comment pertained to how the property will return back to the city after the decommissioning of the plant. Uh, response was given during the public hearing and we were satisfactory. And then the second comment is relative to the who was solicited for our public hearing and our open house. Uh, Council member Wolf followed up with an email to her uh, following week. And then I also sent a map of what would, who we solicited the opening house and the public hearing to. 
um, and those those comments will be included in our facility plan also. Next slide, please. Uh, a tribal leader from Prairie Island Indian community attended both open house and public hearing. At both meetings, Mr. Childs expressed concern of the alignment of the, the treated water, discharge of water to the Mississippi River. The archaeological studies performed to date on the land referenced by Mr. Childs was briefly discussed at the public hearing. A letter to Prairie Island Indian community was drafted by staff and passed on to the council chair for review and signature. This letter was mailed out February 3rd. Next slide, please. Uh, these five comments were received from a local resident during our public hearing. Uh, all comments were addressed during the public hearing. No further follow-up is required. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Mr. Majeski contacted Senator Bingham expressing concern regarding the Metropolitan Council seeking a proposed easement across this property. Staff drafted a letter for the Council's intergovernmental communications to send to Senator Bingham. Uh, I also followed up with an on-site meeting with Mr. Majeski. Uh, at the conclusion of that meeting, Mr. Majeski provided authorization to enter his property to stake the easements and to have the easement appraised. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, three comments were received from a resident living near the existing plant where the sanitary pumping station is proposed. All comments were addressed to their satisfaction during the public hearing. Next slide, please. Uh, so the proposed action that the Metropolitan Council adopt the facility plan for Hastings Wastewater Treatment Plant, MCES project number 809800 per resolution number 2022-3. Next slide, please. So Heidi and I are here to answer any questions along with our managers. Turn it back over to Chair Wolf. Thank you, Chad. Are there any questions or comments? Yeah. Go ahead, uh, Council Member Zarin. Thank you, Chair. Well, uh, it, it looks like uh, this is all in order to me. Uh, we've reviewed this uh, a time again before. I saw so I, I moved the staff's recommendation. Thank you. Do we have a second? I'll second that, uh, Chair Wolf. This is Thank you. Uh, Is there any further discussion? I would just comment that I was the one who hosted the or chaired the both the uh, open house and the other public hearing, and I also went with staff and met with the town board of uh, Ravenna Township to make sure everybody was on the same page with this. And, and this project had been planned to have already started several years ago, but was pushed back because um, development slowed down with the recession. But yeah, this is now the time to to get it done and the price will only go up if we, if we wait. So um, Susan, would you call the roll? Yes, ma'am. Fredson? Aye. Sterner? Aye. Vento? Aye. Wolf? Aye. And Zarin? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. That item passes. Next up would be 2022 42 ratification of after the fact purchase order number 21012387. Mr. Gordon. Thank you, Madam Chair Wolf and committee members. This is Adam Gordon, the manager of the Interceptor Engineering Group, and I'm here with Chad Davison, who just spoke at our last business item, who is the principal engineer with the Interceptor Engineering Group and also is the project manager for this related project. 
And we're here to present uh, the business item 2022-42, which is a ratification of an after the fact purchase order. Next slide, please. So uh, this project is part of the larger Hopkins system improvements project actually divided into uh, half a dozen separate projects. And we initiated back in 2010 uh, and it completes the restoration or reconstruction of five miles of forest made between Hopkins and the East Isles neighborhood in Minneapolis. And it provides service to uh, Hopkins, St. Louis Park and Minneapolis. Uh, the East Isles project is intended to complete the last remaining segment of the Forest Main between Bede Makaska and West 27th Street and Humboldt Avenue South in the East Isles neighborhood. Uh, the scope was to install dual 24-inch uh, uh, PVC Forest Mains within the right away of Humboldt Avenue, replace our drop structure where it enters into our larger diameter interceptor 1MN330. And uh, while we were in there doing street reconstruction, we wanted to uh, help the city through a construction cooperation agreement um, in replacing a storm sewer. Uh, they have flooding issues uh, along Humboldt Avenue. And that was all as part of a city funded. So they wanted to make sure while we reconstructed the street that we took care of that at the same time. Next slide, please. Um, the planning for this project was complicated in that the coordination of a lot of other work was being completed in the Minneapolis Uptown neighborhood. Uh, there's a large reconstruction project of Hennepin Avenue that is being led by the city of Minneapolis. And the city's plan was to complete the utility improvements in Hennepin Avenue in 2022 with street reconstruction following in the 2022 to 2023 time period. In December of 2020, we were quickly getting our plans together. And the plan was to complete the reconstruction of Humboldt Avenue in 2021 in order to beat the schedule for Hennepin Avenue work. Uh, Humboldt would need to be reopened before Hennepin Avenue work was to begin so that residents weren't stranded with an ability to detour onto Hennepin Avenue. Uh, we were working with the city's engineering staff from both the sewer and surface water department and the water department, along with Centerpoint Energy to determine a workable solution for utility realignment in Humboldt Avenue. Um, between our two force mains, the new city storm sewer uh, a new water main that needed to be replaced and the gas main that uh, was in conflict with all this, we basically had to redo all the utilities within Humboldt Avenue. Uh, to further exasperate the problem solving, the staff and the council and the Minneapolis Park and Rec Board could not come to terms on property easement acquisition uh, that was located along the mall that was needed to allow the project to go forward. So we made a decision in December 2020 to split the council's project into two parts, that along Humboldt Avenue and the remainder along the mall to keep a workable solution in play for the Hennepin Avenue reconstruction work. Next slide. So in the same month, December 2020, council staff was also in negotiations with Centerpoint Energy over the terms of, um, terms of agreement to relocate the uh, gas main in 2021. And the work would include the relocation of 1,500 feet of Lino uh, gas main that was in conflict with the new council's 24 inch uh, force main pipes uh, and reconnection of all the resident gas services to the new gas main. Uh, center point Energy had contacted our project manager, Chad, and stated that they had a crew available and wanted to begin the relocation work before the winter frost set in, which would have increased the cost if they had to go into the middle of winter and actually construct this force main, or the gas main, excuse me. Um, Centerpoint was informed by email from our project manager, Chad, that if they began construction, it would be at Centerpoint Energy's risk. 
The project manager also stated that the staff would continue to work to negotiate and execute the agreement. However, the project manager was unaware of council's policy that does not allow for execution of a contract if work has commenced. Um, Centerpoint Energy was operating underneath the, good, the understanding of a good faith by the council PM. And while the council does not complete agreements for work already performed, it's understandable that Centerpoint Energy would act in what they believed was helping council move its project forward. And it's not uncommon for municipalities to require relocation assistance from Centerpoint Energy. And the utility has been known to act to aid municipalities in achieving their street reconstruction efforts. It's not uncommon either that different municipalities conduct their procurements under their own policies and authorities, which are different than councils. So this after the fact is a process of conducting what we like to call lessons learned, not only for the project manager and center point energy, but also for the entire project management group within our capital projects delivery department. And I'm sure Chad would agree that this is not one that will be forgotten. A business item to authorize an agreement for a utility to perform work in excess of 500,000 would normally have been presented to council once the costs were provided and reviewed. In this case, uh, we don't have an agreement. And so we have an invoice that was provided by Centerpoint Energy that was reviewed by our project manager and by a cost estimator from our construction services group and found to be reasonable for the work provided. Uh, the utility relocation was planned and budgeted for underneath the Hopkins System Improvements Program. So with the next slide, the proposed action is, is that the Metropolitan Council ratifies the after the fact purchase order number 21012387 in the amount of $544,533.35 to Centerpoint Energy for relocation of gas main. And with that, knowing that you've probably never seen one of these since your um, duration on council. I'm glad to take all the questions you'll have. Thank you for the presentation. I, I have not ever seen this before and I've been here for almost 13 years. So it, it's, you know, learn something new every day, I guess. Council member Zarin, did you have a question or comment? Both and multiple. Uh, yeah, the first question was, uh, Chair Walt, have you seen this before? <laughs> and you already answered that, uh, that you have not. Um, okay, you know, there's three words there that is going to give everybody a lot of heartburn after the fact, right? Although, as a construction worker myself, I really appreciate the bias towards action. Uh, to get something accomplished while while you have an opportunity to, uh, I I think it's it was prudent to to move forward, but let's not have those three little words ever again, please. <laughs> <laughs> I I've, I've heard you loud and clear. All right. Uh, with that, I, I uh, well I'll well, I'll, I'll stand uh, if anybody else has any questions. Are there any other questions or comments? I'm not seeing any. Uh, oh, go ahead, Council Member Fredson. Ms. Fredson, I would just say that I appreciate that we're actually being sort of honest and straightforward about what happened here. And yeah. it's not ideal, but uh, better to, to, to be open and honest about it as opposed to uh, whatever the alternative would be. So uh, thank you. I, I appreciate that as well. And you know, it, it was good to try and get it done before the freeze. I, you know, I, I understand everybody's heart was in the, the right place and I appreciate the, the thorough explanation. Uh, Ms. Thompson, did you have something you wanted to say? Yes, I think that's the important part is that the intent was good here. It was, you know, uh, an urgency felt to get some action given the nature of the adjoining projects. Uh, I think we've learned a lesson from 
guess that will take over. I'm sorry about my dog. Any other comments or questions? Council members, Aaron? Yeah, council member, uh, Chair Wolf, uh, I recommend staff recommendations since uh, it came in within reason. Is there a second? Potential seconds. Thank you. Ms. Jacoby, did you have something you wanted to <laughs> add? Thank you, Chair Wolf. I was just going to mention Adam did a Adam did a great job explaining the really complicated things that were happening in the sense of urgency. Um, a public, uh, an emergency declaration is clearly defined by state statute where it threatens the health and the safety and the welfare of the general public. This wasn't an emergency declaration. It was just a need to get work moving. Um, and that's when we have an invoice before we have a purchase order or a contract, we call it a after, as council member Zarin said, an after the fact, which we don't like to see. And this one was very, very unusual because of the value. And because it was in the council's signature authority, we felt it was appropriate for full disclosure to bring it forward to you to explain what happened, um, how it, I know there's some practices in place to not have it happen again, but really it's about, because it's within your signature authority, you should see it and have an opportunity to hear about it and then approve it. Thank you. Thank you. I, I agree. I, I appreciate the openness and, and the, the lessons learned. Uh, Susan, would you like to call the roll, please? Yeah, absolutely. Fredson? Aye. Sterner? Aye. Vento? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Zarin? Aye. Thank you. That item passes. Thank you. Next. Next up is 2022-43, uh, Trunk Highway 13 MnDOT Coordination. Mr. Whedon. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Council Members. My name is Tim Whedon. I am Assistant Manager with Interceptor Engineering. I'm here today to present to you on business item 2023-43, Trunk Highway 13 MnDOT Coordination. Next slide, please. This is part of an overall project that we're working on with MnDOT. It's located on the south side of Trunk Highway 13 in the city of Savage. You can see here on this map, um, it's located between Dakota Avenue South and Vernon Avenue South. Next slide, please. The project is to, to relocate an existing 14 and 18 inch PVC force mains. Um, they're currently in the path of MnDOT's reroute uh, or work that they're, ha they're conducting at this location, uh, the intersection of Yosemite Avenue and Trunk Highway 13. Um, they're constructing an overpass, so there will be a number of frontage roads, exit and entrance ramps, and other things that would be constructed on top of our existing force main. Um, that makes maintenance and operation of our existing force mains difficult, if not impossible. So we want to have those relocated from underneath uh, Minda. Um, this will all clean pipes for the crossing of Trunk Highway 13. As you may have recall from the map that we just had up, we do have uh, the force mains cross Highway 13 to the north side and then continue flow to the wet, to the east, excuse me. Uh, the project will also con include construction of uh, a number of valve vaults that will help improve system operation and maintenance. Next slide, please. So our proposed action is that the Metropolitan Council authorize the regional administrator to negotiate and execute a master utility agreement, 21I069, with the Department of Transportation, MnDOT, for interceptor 65 or 8560. And with that, I'm available for questions. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from council members? Not hey, Wolf, any? But yes. This is Turner. I'd make a motion to approve the item as uh, presented. Thank you. We have a motion. Is there a second? Fred's all second. Thank you. 
Any further discussion? Susan, you can call the roll, please. Fredson? Aye. Sterner? Aye. Bento? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Zarin? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that item is, uh, that item passes, and we move on to 2022-44, Water Supply Technical Analysis and Outreach for hydro Hydrologic and Hydrogeologic Services Master Contracts 21P-208A and 21P-208B. Ms. Ross. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, I'm here to talk about some hydrologic and hydrogeologic research work that we want to get started. Um, next slide. The contracts that we're issuing help to support the council's water supply planning work. And specifically, we are charged uh, by Minnesota statutes to maintain a base of technical information for uh, sound water supply decisions across the Twin Cities area. And so this, uh, these master contracts help us to do that work. Next slide. And uh, the scope of that work is also uh, guided by and directed by council policy and several of our regional plans, system plans, and also reports recently done by our advisory committees, Water Supply Technical Advisory Committee and Water Supply Advisory Committee, MOSAC. So this is uh, informed by a lot of uh, foundational work that has already gone on, as well as Minnesota statute. Next slide. Uh, the technical information that will be provided through these master contracts, and it will be done in collaboration with our expert partners, helps provide that foundation for regional and local plan updates and plan implementation. And as you know, we are starting to think about the update of those regional policy and system plans. And so having some good sound information to inform that process is going to make all of it uh, stronger. Next slide. Uh, the work that we're doing through these master contracts will be funded with support from the Clean Water Land and Legacy Amendment. And so I did include some of the details of that language, but we do have um, an appropriation specifically for projects to address emerging threats to the drinking water supply in the metro area uh, to help us provide cost-effective regional solutions, uh, leverage interjurisdictional cooperation because water, of course, does not follow our political boundaries. Um, and we also use this funding for supporting local implementation of reliability projects, water efficiency projects, um, helping to map, understand, model, uh, groundwater resources in the metro area. Next slide. The products and deliverables that these master contracts will cover um, include engaging our water supply advisory committees and our other stakeholders. That's a really important part of the work that we do. Um, we will be producing studies, reports, and also some analytical and modeling tools that will be used in various ways. Um, and there's going to be at the end of that a, a piece of this will include some public outreach because um, information is most effective when people know about it and know how to have access to it. So that is the scope generally of the master contracts. Next slide. Um, unlike a lot of our engineering projects, this is more information based. And so uh, when we put out a request for proposals, we also did highlight some example projects. This is not um, the type content wise of projects that we'll be doing, but in terms of the scope, the products, the uh, tools, we wanted to have um, work that generates information similar to the equity considerations for place-based advocacy and decisions. That's a data set, it's interactive, it's really foundational for helping to support additional work. Um, we've done projects in the past like low flow characteristics of the Mississippi River so we want to be thinking about some research understanding um, flow on that water supply source. Um, we've done projects looking at aquifer recharge, contaminant plume mapping. So those would be the kinds of things that these master contracts will help cover. Uh, next slide. We will be working out the details of this research 
with input from our advisory committees and the conversations that those advisory committees and other work groups have been having over the past years, particularly in the past couple of years, has really helped us um, identify what work needs to be done and we'll be going back to them as we scope those projects to get input to make sure that uh, our products and this work adds the most value and is applicable and useful, not only at our regional level to our questions about policy and planning, but also at that local level as well, because water supply is uh, the authority, the responsibility of our local communities. Next slide. I mean, in evaluating proposals, uh, we did pull uh, on water supply planning staff, but also on our colleagues in water resources, knowing that groundwater and surface water questions are very intricately linked. Uh, but we also did re reach out to two technical advisors uh, from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, who is a very important partner to us with water supply issues, and also the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux community. So um, they were very helpful in reviewing these proposals. Uh, as we reviewed them, we were looking at uh, the proposer quality, their qualifications and their experience, um, not just generally on the subject, but for specifically their experience here in the metro area and with our stakeholders. Uh, we were looking at price and also uh, their ability to meet their current and future needs, their service delivery plans, because we know because this is so stakeholder driven that the timing can shift um, and the scope may change. And so we were looking at their ability to adapt to our stakeholder needs. Next slide. The Office of Equal Opportunity assigned a Met Council underutilized business program goal of 15% for this project work. And in their review, OEO did determine that the recommended proposers met the council's good faith effort requirements for this project, which was very good to hear. Next slide. And so with that process and our goals, we are requesting that the council authorize regional administrator to award and execute master contracts 21P208, whoops, shifted my language, I think, uh, 208A for $500,000 with bar engineering and 21P208B for $300,000 with Emmons and Olivier Resources Incorporated, uh, specifically to provide hydrogeologic research and hydrologic research to support our water supply planning. So the total would not exceed $800,000. And I would welcome any questions about the work or about our proposal. Thank you. Any questions or comments from council members? Uh, council member Sterner. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh Chair Wolf, and my question would be just uh, both of these uh, firms, do they have like long uh, experience in that kind of thing and they're qualified, they participate in, in the, you know, the water supply and things like that? They are both quite experienced. Um, we have worked specifically with bar engineering in the past, uh, particularly on various things, but uh, particularly on our regional groundwater flow modeling, um, although they have diverse experience otherwise. And uh, EOR also has done a lot of work um, across the region with various water supply stakeholders, counties, uh, cities. And so we're really looking forward to working with both of these groups on these technical projects. All right, thank you very much. Any other questions? And I, should, I forgot to mention, I should add too, that in the water supply planning group, we are doing this hydrogeologic Kind of research-based work. Um, we are also going to be coming to you with master contracts for more engineering, water supply engineering specific projects as well. So together we are, are going to be doing both sort of the source and understanding the systems, but also the infrastructure. So that's another master contract you'll be hearing about soon. Thank you. If there are no other questions or comments, we'd be in need of a motion. Vento President, moves. I move the approval or second. Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> Motion by Vento, second by Fredson. Susan, would you call the roll, please? Sure. Fredson? Aye. Sterner? Aye. Vento? Aye. Wolf? Aye. And Zarin? Aye. Thank you. Thank you.
That you. brings us to the end of our business part of the agenda and on to information. The first information item would be the 2020-2021 Water Resources Monitoring Update. Mr. Henley? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, committee members. So I presented back in mid-December, um, kind of giving a, a recap of the last couple of years of water quality monitoring, and uh, Council Member Sterner had a, had a question to, about a couple uh, lakes of interest uh, near Apple Valley, and so I am here today to do a quick update, follow up on, on that question. So there was a, the question was regarding Farquhar and Long Lakes, again, uh, near Apple Valley. And so our, uh, our Council Limnologist, Brian Johnson, who works in the Water Resources Group, um, looked into this a little bit. So um, special thanks to him for putting together this, this summary. And this is, again, when, in response to when I had the lake grade map up. And um, these both of these lakes did receive an F grade based on the Council's grading scheme in 2020. And, you know, this has a, it has a history of an impairment that goes back to a water quality impairment that goes back to 2002. And then there was some uh, total maximum daily load studies and an implementation plan put together in 2009, 2010. This is um, being led by the city of Apple Valley, so they're the ones um, really, you know, putting these actions on the ground, implementing what's in the plan. Um, there's been funding put towards these lakes from the state of Minnesota, as well as the Vermilion Rivers Joint Powers Organization um, that's being used to fund some of these projects. Um, the kind of good news out of this is the water quality trend does appear to be improving. Um, it just hasn't improved kind of outside of the overall grade of F. Uh, the grade is broken down into some aspects of it that appear to be improving. Total phosphorus received a D, algae had a D, um, and that's up from Fs um, a few years ago. So th it does appear to be improving. Um, it's, it still hasn't reached that water quality standard or, or it, some of our parameters for an F grade. Um, but the work continues and there's a lot of um, practices being put on the ground. And I believe that was where the, a lot of the question was about too is what's being done. And so some examples of projects being done by the city of Apple Valley, uh, infiltration basins being installed, street, street, street sweeping practices adjusted, stormwater infrastructure retrofits. Uh, that's been a lot of the kind of infrastructure projects. And then they've done a lot of lake management techniques as well, um, surveying the fish, stocking the fish. Long Lake actually has some drawdowns um, where they can manage some of the kind of more of like a reset of getting some of the aquatic plant communities and the fish communities reset so that some of the more natural um, species can come back in and, and really just focusing on aquatic plant management in a lot of, in both of those lakes. So city of Apple Valley is on it. Uh, there's a ways to go, but uh, we're improving in that area. With that quick, just follow up update, happy to take any questions, but uh, hopefully that answered your question, council member Sterner. Uh, yes, it does. The only other thing maybe I had was possibly on uh, have they kind of like talked to the uh, landowners about like fertilization because they I think both those lakes they have the backyards that are grass yards that go directly into the lakes to that. So as well if that's one of the education thing ongoing with all the other good things that you're doing. We can we can look into that too to see if what if that's one of the implementation plan items or. I know some, some cities just have that as part of their plan. So thank you, Madam Chair, committee, committee members. Thank you. Do any other council members have any questions? If not, we will move on to the next information item. Uh, the Water Efficiency Grant Program Update, Mr. El Hassan. And I am going to have to sign off in just a couple of minutes to do another meeting. So I'm going to hand the gavel over to Council Member Vento for the end portion of the meeting, if that's OK. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, Council Members, uh, in, ja in January 11th Environmental Committee meeting, we presented about the grant efficiency grant program that the Met Council runs for the communities. And uh, council members have some questions and suggestions. Um, I'm coming back today uh, to uh, to present to you quickly uh, some of the updates that uh, um, how we handled some of the questions that we received. Uh, one of the questions was asking about wh where are the communities, what are the communities who received the 
uh, the uh, the grant program for 2019, and and you can see in front of you, and included in the agenda, attached to the to the agenda, there is the uh, map of the communities, the 39 communities who received the uh, grant in the in the last uh, run of the uh, of the grant program. There is a couple of other questions. Uh, one of them is the percentage. Uh, we when we came and presented in January. Uh, we were suggesting to uh, have a 10%, 90% cost share uh, between the council and the cities. And some council members have expressed uh, uh, interest in increasing the city uh, contribution. And so when we advertised this program, we went to 80% from the council and 20% from the uh, community. Uh, that's that's uh, increasing the amount that the cost share from the communities uh, uh, to to participate into this program. Uh, one of the other advices that we received from the council members in that meeting is that homeowners contribution uh, should be part of this program, and that's we left that in the program. Also, it was a criteria in the past, and we maintain that uh, to be, to continue into the next round of these uh, grants. Um, Council members also asked about talking points uh, so that it could be used to communicate about this program to their uh, constituents, the communities. And uh, we are working right now with uh, RA communication to get these ready. As soon as we get them ready, we are gonna give them to Susan and Susan is gonna uh, share it with all of you. Uh, just to an update of this program, this program has was advertised on Monday, January 31st to all communities in the metro area. Uh, with Oops, I think we lost you. Oh dear. <laughs> yep, Ali, you'll need to turn your video off. Ali? We are not able to hear you, Ali. Are you there with us? Um, so he must be having technical difficulties, Trevento. Um, how would you like to proceed? I, I, I kind of sense that he was getting toward the end of his presentation. Um, because he was talking about the talking points being forwarded to you and distributed to us then. Um, I would ask that they be distributed to the full council so that all of us can share this information with our, our um, communities. Um, and it looks like he's still having trouble here. So yes. So, if there's more that, oh, there he is. There we go. Yep. Uh, is there any, um, so I'm not sure which part you missed. <laughs> I missed, uh, or you didn't hear from me. Uh, you had just finished saying that um, Susan would distribute the the um, talking points, and I just recommended that the talking points go to the the full council so that everyone everyone can promote the the program. Thank you, Madam Chair. We'll do that. Okay. And uh, the program already has been advertised since last week. And we have the first, we received the first application today. Oh, good. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, I think it's, people are very excited about the program. Good. Questions, Thank you, from, Madam Chair. questions from the committee? Anyone? Well, seeing none, thank you very much. Um, Actually, Chair Vento. Uh, Chair. Pardon? Yes. Member uh, President here. I would just say I appreciate that uh, uh, staff brought this back to the committee's attention, made some changes in response to council member feedback. I think that means a lot. So thank you. Thank you for your advices. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. I second, yeah, I second council member Fredson. Yes, Susan. Yes, thank you. So Ali, did you have information you wanted to share regarding the application link or um about the newsletter article yeah the we have we have a newsletter article that's uh live online right now on our website in the med council website to uh to uh, educate applicants about the program 
Um, I think I will I, I will hope that if Susan will, is going to be able to share that with you after this meeting so that you can forward it. That's while we are preparing the talking points, you can share that information as well as the application form. There is application form, it's, everything is online. So uh, you can forward these to the communities in your jurisdiction and or in your in, uh, as your constituents. And uh, then the, the talking points to encourage them to apply is, is coming after that. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further? Okay, we will move on to uh, our final agenda item for the evening, the general manager report. Good afternoon, council members. I have a really quick item that I'm actually uh, kind of surprised that I'm in this position of being able to share. It's good news. Uh, ES is not used to getting a lot of public attention, uh, but recently our COVID wastewater testing has really been a hot item. So not only have we gotten a mention in the New York Times, but in January, we broke a record for ES, but also a bit of a record in terms of competing with the main homepage. So we had 10,975 views of our wastewater testing and the homepage for the council had 10,087 views. So uh, that speaks volumes in terms of that's way out of our norm. And it's, uh, I think, if there's, you know, looking for silver linings in a cloud of this whole pandemic, the fact that it's gone on as long as it is has, has I think kept the emphasis on continuing to look at research like this effort to see if we can figure out how wastewater can help us manage a future virus in a better way. So it, it should help us be better prepared for future times um, and be one more tool in that tool chest. And we're really happy because we're here after all to protect public health and the environment. And this is definitely a new twist on being able to do that for us. Great, kudos. It's been well publicized and deservedly so. We, um, we have gotten lots of support from our communications folks and they've been coming up with great ideas and um, we really are appreciative. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, with that, we will adjourn seven minutes before the hour of five. And as Council Chair Zelly often says, um, the sun's still shining and we can go out and enjoy the rest of this day. Thank you. Have a good evening, Thanks, everyone. Sarah. Thank you.